failure. Congestive failure is the inability of the heart muscle to essentially overpower the vascular resistance presented by the body. And so it leaves typically blood remaining within the ventricle at the end of contraction. And that can happen because of ischemia. It can happen because of viral myocardiopathy. It can happen for a variety of reasons. But net of it all, it's the inability of the muscle to effectively propel blood through the system. A healthy heart, as seen here, beats approximately 60 to 100 times a minute, providing oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. The lower left chamber of the heart, called the left ventricle, is the main pumping chamber. There are many different conditions that can lead to congestive heart failure, including a prior heart attack, high blood pressure, and coronary artery disease. Any of these can prevent the heart from efficiently pumping blood to the rest of the body. As a result, the heart may beat faster and the ventricle may increase in size, becoming an even less effective pump. When the kidneys sense the reduced blood flow, they attempt to compensate by retaining more water and salt. This excess fluid retention often causes congestion in the tissues and results in swelling and an increased strain on an already weak heart. The progressive effect of the heart failing to properly circulate blood and congestion due to fluid retention is known as congestive heart failure. Well, one of the researchers looking into this basically started with the concept of understanding this, the fact that the heart muscle simply was not effectively propelling blood through the system and then also knowing that immersion produces a decreased peripheral vascular resistance. So he and his co-workers did something that I could never ever hope to do in the United States. This is a Japanese study. Oh, let me go into this first. This is a classification of heart failure. And class one is basically mild congestive failure. There's no limitation to physical activity. Ordinary physical activity doesn't cause undue, undue fatigue, palpitation, or dyspnea. Class two is mild, slight limitation of physical activity, generally comfortable at rest, but ordinary physical activity results in fatigue, palpitations, and shortness of breath. Class three is marked limitation of physical activity, comfortable at rest, but less than ordinary activity causes fatigue, palpitation, or dyspnea. And class four, severe congestive failure, means that basically you're bed fast, fundamentally. These top three categories are all categories where some degree of physical activity in some cases has been shown to be useful. Well, what Dr. Tay did was interesting. He said, okay, if immersion does this, what I'm gonna do basically is to put a Schwann-Gans catheter into the, ventri into the heart and I'm going to measure pressures, I'm going to measure ejection fraction during a period of immersion over a four-week therapy course. And what he found basically in these mild to moderate class one to three New York Heart Association category congestive failure individuals was that their ejection fractions increased dramatically. The ejection fraction increased from 25% up to over 30%. At the same time, in looking at x-rays, the ratio of their heart size to their general thorax decreased, and the left ventricle dimension decreased in size. So what happened during that four-week period in congestive failure patients as a function of immersion is their hearts became more efficient. They shrunk and at the same time, they were pumping more blood per beat. Another researcher, Asa Sider, basically decided he was going to look at what happened during a period of eight weeks of actual exercise training. The first study were just people sitting in warm water. Asa's study basically looked at 10 congestive failure patients and or 15 congestive failure patients with 10 congestive failure controls. And he did eight weeks of training three times a week 
45 minutes at 40 to 70 percent of heart rate reserve. And what he found basically is that the control patients decreased in walking distance, increased very, or decreased in muscle function as measured by a bunch of strength parameters, increased slightly in their walking distance, decreased in peak VO2, decreased in exercise capacity, increased slightly in quality of life. But look what happened with the exercise subjects. They dramatically increased in muscle function. Their walking distance trebled the control group, or even more than that. Their peak VO2 increased significantly, especially when compared to the control group. Exercise capacity increased significantly over the control group and their quality of life as measured by essentially SF36 dramatically improved. And these were all statistically significant values. So it made a big difference in the lives of these cardiac patients. He then looked at what happens during a single session of immersion. And what he did basically was to look at congestive failure subjects compared with normal functioning heart controls. What he found is that during immersion in thermoneutral water, heart rates dropped in both groups. Now it dropped more in the normals than it did in the congestive failure patients. Stroke volume increased significantly in both groups, much more in the normals than in the, than in the congestive failure group. Ejection fraction increased much more in the congestive failure group than it did in the normal group. But again, ejection fractions in the normal group were already at normal. So this increase above them makes logical sense. And cardiac output increased in both groups, less in the congestive failure than in the normals, but still quite significantly. And again, these were all statistically significant values.